Hi, everybody. Welcome. On behalf of the National Press Club and the National Press Club Journalism Institute, I'm really happy to see you all. Uh, I'm Julie Moose. I'm the executive director of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, which is working to close the gap between journalism and civic engagement. And um, I was looking back this morning to see when we first started talking about this program on fixtures in journalism, and it was in August, <laughs> um, which, uh, which is, uh, feels like a little while ago at this point. So um, we, uh, Lindsay Palmer and I first started talking about it then. Lindsay literally wrote the book, which I'm gonna hold up, <laughs> oh. on fixtures. Uh, it is available for sale today if you don't have a copy and are interested, and, um, uh, and I highly recommend it. Lindsay interviewed uh, 75 fixers in 39 countries about working with reporters as locally based guides, translators, coordinators, problem solvers, and so much more that everybody will talk about. And Lindsay is also an associate professor of global media at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and has worked as a TV news producer. I just realized I'm blocking the panel as I stand there, so I'm gonna move out of the way. Um, and I'm gonna turn the panel over to Lindsay in just a moment uh, to introduce everybody else who we're so happy to have with us. Um, but first I wanna um, call out a couple of people who are also in the room who will be helpful. Um, we are fortunate to have our friends here from Reporters Without Borders, Daphne, and, um, and from the International Women's Media Foundation, we have Charlotte and Madison. And um, we will have uh, folks with us from the Committee to Protect Journalists as well. We have lots of uh, press club members here, and um, we have a uh, vice chair of our Press Freedom Committee, Rachel Oswald is here. And, uh, and just in the nick of time, we have our uh, new uh, president of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, Angela Greiling Keen, with us as well. And we also wanna make sure that we welcome everybody who is joining us on our live stream. So we hope that you will participate and uh, ask questions and uh, add your comments to the discussion. We wanna take questions throughout this, um, this program, so please just uh, you know just flag me. I'll have the microphone, uh, and if you're on the live stream, just go ahead and comment on that page where you're watching. And uh, Beth Francesco, who is at the back of the room and is the senior director of the Journalism Institute, will be your voice in the room, reading out uh, reading out your questions. So I am going to um, turn the program over to Lindsay now with, again, great thanks for bringing this all together and bringing us into this really important conversation. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. This is really an awesome opportunity just to get the chance to sit up here with people who are doing such important work. And I really want today to be about all of the people sitting here on this panel and much, much less about anything that I would have to say. So I'm gonna just start us off with like one question. And the goal I think for the panel really is to have more of a conversation with each of you and with, with whoever is um, out there listening and watching the live stream. So I know from the research I've had the opportunity to do um, that there are a number of aspects to the job of what is sometimes called news fixing. Although as we have talked about together already a little bit, um, that term fixer is a highly contested term. It's not necessarily something um, everyone's okay with, and there are some, some connotations that we might wanna unpack a little bit. But I'd like to hear from each of you a little bit about how your work has led you to, to essentially collaborate with foreign correspondents, either, I know in Chris's case, right here in the United States, um, or in the case of some of, of the rest of you overseas, Tell us a little bit about how you got into doing that work and just kind of introduce yourselves to us a little bit. And then I'd also love to hear from Larry, um, both about your work working with foreign correspondents, but also on, on the side of international um, foreign desk um, editing. Why don't we start with Ashraf? Just do some introductions first. Um, hi, my name's Ashraf Khalil. Um, I worked in the Middle East for close to 20 years, uh, based in Cairo, Baghdad, and Jerusalem met Mr. Kaplow, spent many, many months in stark terror in the, in the Hamra Hotel in Baghdad. Um, and I actually am here as a bit of a hybrid because I was a freelancer for most of my career, so there was long stretches where I was both fixing and writing independently. And, and uh, you know, like I'd, I'd run around with somebody and fix for them, and 
you know, gather quotes and then write for, you know, write for the San Francisco Chronicle or some other place. Uh, so, you know, I was able to kind of double dip. And that was, um, I think I would make a particularly bad fixer because, frankly, I want the credit. You know, I want the byline. You know, there's a, there's a self-effacing element of fixing and, and like being a TV producer as well. You know, the same sort of thing. Like you're, you're the person who really makes it all happen, but you don't get the credit. And some people can groove to that. I probably wouldn't. So it, would, it, was, it worked for me because I was getting bylines elsewhere. But if I was just a fixer, I think I'd probably grow to hate whatever correspondent I was working with. And, and I, just from Cairo, I have a number of friends who this was a topic of debate where you call them a fixer and you, you know, you've insulted them. And I think that comes from just sort of the frequently unhealthy dynamic between the correspondent and the fixer. Like you can call them a news assistant, but if you're mistreating them, it doesn't matter. Like, it's, uh, like the, the title never struck me as a problem. It's the behavior and, and the relationship. And there's a lot to get into after that uh, from there. So well, I'm looking forward to discussing it. I'm, I'm, you know, I've never heard of anyone studying this phenomenon, it's, which tells you a little bit about how under um, scrutinized or just you know, out of the spotlight they tend to be. So thanks to you, this is a, this is a really cool topic. There's a lot to it. Um, my name is Susan Hedamus. I, um, I worked as a fixer since 2006, since the beginning when the war was uh, between Israel and Hezbollah in Beirut. Uh, before that, I was a news anchor, but I enjoyed my work as a fixer much more than being a news anchor. I love my work. I want to thank Judy and uh, <laughs> Lindsay for giving us this opportunity. Actually, throughout my work, as Ashraf was saying, uh, I was doing a little bit of both, fixing and part-timer with some... Uh, now I'm with the Washington Post, so I was doing both. but. I've realized that many people feel um, humiliated when you call them fixers. I personally never felt that way. Maybe because uh, I knew how important that job is. It, to me, it is, uh, and it is the spinal cord of journalism. If, if you don't have people there, local on the ground, who has contacts, who knows everything what's going on, your job as a foreign journalist is going to be very difficult. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of risks because this fixer who's on the ground is sparing you and helping you avoid all these things. So um, right now I'm with the Washington Post, but I loved my work as a fixer. And I know many people didn't, didn't like the term fixer. I remember one of them, uh, he was asked uh, by a foreign press, uh, I need a fixer, can you help me? And he said, I'm not a plumber. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so fixing is not with all respect to plumbers, you know. But <laughs> fixing, is, um, fixing is something, uh, if you can go into the details of this after you guys ask, it, is, uh, it makes me, when I finish the job, and some of the journalists email me back, and some, they don't even say thank you, when they tell me how great I did in that job, and when I'm able to convince both, to connect both cultures, because the foreign uh, correspondent is coming from one culture, the person I'm interviewing is from another culture, and I am from a different country from, from both, but I speak both languages, so I can connect them both and get something out of it. Uh, my name is Chris Noodle. Um, uh, I started out as a, um, a filmmaker, and um, I produced an independent film, and from there, uh, a friend of mine had been contacted by someone at National Geographic on a subject, on a drug subject, and uh, he said, Chris is your guy. And so I, that's how I fell into fixing, uh, being a fixer. I'm not offended by the term, but I often find that fixers are doing more than just fixing. So if that's happening, I think they should be credited appropriately. Um, from there, it just started snowballing, and I just started working on more and more documentary films deep into the, the drug game, and, and I specialize now in, um, in, in covering those subjects, uh, the war on drugs. So that's how I got my job. Okay. And I'm Larry Kaplow. I'm the Middle East editor at NPR, which means I work with our correspondents who are in the region. Uh, we have four bureaus there and have people, also additional people going in from time to time. 
Um, and before that, I was a correspondent for newspapers and uh, a magazine for 12 years in the Middle East, in uh, Jerusalem and traveling around the region, and then Baghdad. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, um, so I've worked, you know, I come at it right now from the editor's side, and I guess what struck me about this is just the range of all the opinions we've already heard in the not, points of view, really, in the first few minutes. And that's what we try to do, is just have the discussion about who are our correspondents working with, call them whatever they want to be called, pretty much, um, and include them in our plans. Uh, they are often in a position where they're not just helping our correspondents gather news, but actually protecting the safety of our correspondents and the f their fellow producers or fixers or people who they're working with. And so we trust them a lot, and we try to work them into our plans and keep them in touch with what our interests are. I know I think it's all about communication. First of all, there's a language barrier. Even if they speak great English, there's still language barriers and app barriers and telephone call distance. Uh, trying to translate exactly what the organization is interested in so they don't go out and do things that expend a lot of energy and work and actually aren't what we're looking for. Or also so they don't take a risk that we really don't want to take for, for any case. Um, so that's what we try to do is just have the discussion with our correspondents. And aside from that, you want the correspondent to build their own bond with whoever they're working with locally so they fit together and have their own chemistry. Some people can work with each other great, and then other, other matches don't work so much, and it doesn't have anything to do with, their, with, their, with whether they're good or bad at their job. It just can be temperament or style. Uh, the last thing I'd say right now is on Ashraf's point about the idea of someone being a local, a local person uh, fixing to writing to, you know, now the continuum is, is so blended. There's not so much difference. It's a case-by-case -case thing again, but there are people who might be in the role of a, quote, fixer in one case who are almost acting as a kind of senior analyst at a think tank on another assignment. Mm -hmm. And you have people at think tanks who are coming out and doing work that fixers might do in time to arranging their appointments and doing in the field work. Uh, I think that whole spectrum is kind of blended together in different and interesting ways now. Well, Larry, I, I heard you mention um, one of the, the important roles that, that news fixers and local producers play, which is that role of security at certain points in time. And, and depending on where um, the, the foreign correspondent and the, the local um, fixer may be working, that effort at security might be one of the primary aspects of the job. And so before we turn it out, because I really want us to, to have a, a sort of Q&A almost right away here, Tell us a little bit more, and in, 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 any of you who'd like to speak to this, tell us a little bit more about the challenges involved in keeping your clients, uh, the foreign correspondents, safe. What are some of the challenges in that particular task? I can, um, I can give you an example of an incident that happened with me. And that was um, in 2014, actually, there was an American uh, crew. <coughs> they wanted to cross from from the Lebanese border town of Arsal to Syria. Of course, it was illegal to cross, but the border was open. And I was with them, of course, as a fixer. And also, they called me local producer, but I was a fixer. So we, we crossed the whole crew up to a, a house up on the hill. And we were already in the Syrian territory. And so we sat there. We were with, uh, with rebels. We sat there, and we, uh, they prepared the cameras and everything to interview the, the rebel leader. And all of a the sudden, there was a flight coming. I mean, we could hear a rolling of a plane. And, and they were speaking in Arabic. Of course, the crew didn't understand what they were saying. And they were telling them, maybe when they're coming back, they were going to hit us. And that's when I told the, the reporter and the crew, we have to leave now. And they were like, what's going on? And I tell them. We'll talk later, but we have to leave now. And in fact, and they were like, what are you talking about? Let's leave. So we picked up all our equipments and we left. And on the way, they were telling us, the rebels were telling us, that usually the, the Syrian airstrikes, they pass first, and they come back and hit the place. 
So we were really out of there. And I remember the rebels told us, you have to be very careful next time. So if I didn't understand the language, if I didn't hear what they were talking about, I, I would have stayed for the interview, and maybe they would have hit us, maybe. So that's one incident. But, uh, well, that takes also correspondents who, who listen to you. Exactly. I mean, you can't protect them. I mean, exactly. it's like, you know, this happened more in Baghdad, um, although I think in Lebanon there was a whole other sort of cottage industry in, in cross-border, yeah. you know, getting you across yeah. and getting you hooked up with the road. Like, that's almost became yeah. its own industry, I think, for a while that's in right. Lebanon. Um, in Iraq, definitely you would have situations if the correspondent's not listening, the correspondent ends up putting the news assistant in danger. And that mm -hmm. can, you know, if, if, you, if you give the impression, intentionally or otherwise, that their life is less important than your story. You know, that, that I mean, I, I saw that happen, you know, without naming names, you know, we, we, I was with the LA Times and, and we, you know, we would have, you know, people would come into Iraq and they're like, they're hard charging, this is their chance, they're in Iraq, they're trying to get their front page story. And, and fair, fair enough, you know, everybody's ambitious, but I mean, we, we had one person come in and they scored a very big story and alienated half the newsroom, half of our internal newsroom in the process. And, you know, they were, I think it was something about death squads. And so they're like grilling, you know, death, grilling, grilling militia leaders and, the, and the, the, you know, the, the news assistant is there going, I don't want to ask him that question. Are you crazy? What are you doing? And by the time, this, by the, time the big fat byline runs, He's an amen, and they're like totally demoralized and wondering if we care about any of them, any of them. And so, I mean, it, it, it can get really dicey if they're, if they're not heeding the safety advice, then it becomes everyone's in danger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to your question, uh, that answer, I could go on all day. I mean, there's an infinite number of answers. I've lost track of, um, but in my specific uh, lane, things I'm worried about if we're embedded with gun traffickers or drug traffickers or gang members or anything. Sometimes you're in environments where you can't predict what might happen. It might have nothing to do with you. Some people might think one thing, but it's another. Um, so the, you want to be as discreet as possible and, and as kind as possible and get in and get out. And, but Obviously, there's, there's just, I don't want to be sensational, but there's, yeah, there's an infinite number of things that I've seen that can go wrong or happen. So you just have to, as you said earlier, fixers act, acting as security, you also have to do that too, you know, and be aware of your surroundings. And if you're not, if you're a fixer and you're not built for that, you probably shouldn't be doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. I mean, there are things you can do to, I, th I think, I hope that there's more awareness about all of this just in the last 10 years. For one thing, you know, the second intifada was very uh, dangerous for, for reporters and the people they worked with locally. It was just very close quarters. Um, there wasn't uh, the kidnapping threat there, so mm -hmm. you kind of felt like you could go anywhere, but there was fighting and there were bullets flying. Um, and then in the Iraq war, of course, there were kidnappings and eventually that restricted our movements more. Um, in some ways, maybe kept us in and a little bit safer considering other sh fighting that was going on. Um, but I like to think that things have evolved some from some of the, hopefully learning from some of the things that have happened and just the discussions. I mean, th there are things that I think we do routine routinely now is talk about the local, st we, we have a, a meeting before anyone goes any place dangerous. And it's the correspondent, the editor. There's a person uh, at NPR uh, who's responsible for correspondent safety and security full time. Um, there are memos that go around and notes that go off to our various departments about what's taking place now. Um, and sometimes the local person is in on this meeting. On It's usually a conference call because the correspondent's far away. If not, there are questions. From both points of view, like for the correspondent, do you know who you're going with? Have we worked with them before? Do they know us? You, you come into some situations where the local person may not actually know what they're getting into because 
we're usually going to their hometown when some crisis is happening. Ashraf, you, you probably saw this in Baghdad. They had lived in a society where things were just frozen in time for a long time. And they might not have known how bad things could get in a conflict. Just little things like you might, if it's their first time doing this, you might want to tell them, uh, don't go back and tell your family you got a great new job working with someone, mm -hmm. uh, an outsider now. Because a year from now, people might hate those outsiders, and you're still in your neighborhood, and Definitely you're going to be known as someone who Definitely works with them. Definitely in Iraq. Um, try not to go to neighborhoods where they're known. If you're doing sort of the, just the simple Vox story, they're still going to be identifying themselves as working with this foreign group. Uh, so go to another part of town so you're not talking to people who know where they live and know who their families are. Uh, so things like the situation you were in, I mean, it's, there's supposed to be a discussion before they go out nowadays. I don't think we thought about this before. You know, what's the signal that if anyone in the group gives it, we all leave without asking questions? Mm. Because everyone's looking down at their notebook or through their lens, and everyone's sort of myopic. One person might pick up on something that nobody else is seeing. What's the safe word? Mm. Right, yeah. right, or the cough or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I once got like my colleagues sort of. I you know, this is you know, they got my people almost in trouble and and but just by thinking I knew a little bit too much. In, we were in Iraq, heading into an area where there was clashes and in Baghdad, and um, having you know I, I speak flawed but functional Egyptian accented Arabic, and. Um, Hmm? You're being modest, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, you, 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 well, you bump up against the limits of it in a place like Iraq. And, and we were heading into an area with clashes, and our guys were, were going, were saying, no, we can't go there. They said in Arabic, Hayermuna. They're going to throw, the, which in Arabic is, is a direct translation, they're going to throw us, which I thought meant throw us out, like they're going to kick us out if we go down this street. So I'm like, oh, fine, let them throw us, whatever. In Iraqi slang, to throw us means to shoot at us. And I did not know that. And when I realized what I had done later on, I had some making up to do, like some some real apologizing, because I mean, you know, in Iraq these were these were grown men. These were these were these were adults. Many of them were professional translators. Some of them were many of them were doctors. We found I don't know about in other places. We we had a lot of uh, medical professionals yeah. became fixers for us in Iraq because a they were good under pressure. They had good language skills. And you know they could think on their feet when stuff was crazy, but um, but yeah, I almost got my own people in trouble by by knowing just a little bit, in, knowing, knowing just enough to be really dangerous. I had an incident. Um, actually, it was the photographer who opposed that we leave. Uh, we were also in this very dangerous uh, uh, border town where uh, at that time ISIS was in control of the town, mm. and and we were out uh, filming and interviewing. We were in one of the camps and. Then it was around 6 o'clock and the lights were dimming and I told, I felt something was wrong because I saw a lot of young guys texting. And why are they always all texting and they would look at each other and I just felt something was wrong. And I told the reporter, the journalist who was with me, I think we should get out. And she said, um, yeah, if you feel that way. And then the photographer said, and he was also a foreigner, he wasn't a local. And he said, why do we have to get out? And I told him, I feel something is wrong. And he said, what? And I said, Please don't argue with me, but let's just try to get out of here. And then there was a guy who was who came and approached me. He said, do you want my, my advice? And I said, what? He was from the camp. Get out of here, because there, these people are planning to kidnap you. Mm -hmm. And I remember I told the, journal, the photographer, listen, I'm not going to tell you if you don't want to go. I'm going alone. I'm taking you with me, because you are my responsibility. Me, as a local fixer, I'm responsible for your safety and for the safety of the correspondent. So we get out right now. So fortunately, the correspondent said, yes, let's get out. And we got out. But some of them, like you said, they would they wouldn't listen. Mm -hmm. They just want to do their job. He said, uh, I remember he said, this is the best lightning, lightning that I can mm -hmm. take photos. And I said, I don't care about your lightning <laughs> photos. It's harder, it's harder with photographers because they've got to get up close. They, they yeah. have to yeah. get <laughs> close to it. I mean, and they're so conspicuous. Right. The, yeah. the writers, you know, if, it, if we have to, we can do our job over the phone. But you can't yeah. do that if you're a photographer or a TV person. So yeah, there's always going to be that push-pull. Yeah. Uh, to what you said um, about risk, and su risk assessment, I had never heard the term until I heard my colleagues talking about that. 
And um, risk, risk assessment is, is really, as I've learned over the years, is trying to think about it like a math problem and trying to figure out what could go wrong every single poss possible facet. You can't prepare for everything, but it's important. And to what you said about intuition, I think that is incredibly important as a fixer and as a journalist, anyone working in the field, trusting your gut and having, being able to feel what's going on around you and really listening to that, listening to that gut feeling when it's saying, you know, it's time's up. Well, let's go ahead and start taking some, some questions from the, the room now. And remember that if you're watching on live stream, you can also send questions, and we will try to, to ask them for you and, and get answers for you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Rachel Oswald. I'm a member of the club and a working reporter in Washington. Thank you so much for this panel. Um, I've had the opportunity to hire fixers um, for some reporting projects abroad. Um, and, I, and I really care about always doing it better and really making sure that I'm mindful of the power dynamics again. I really appreciate this opportunity to hear from you all. I'm curious about what you've observed of changing structures in the, in the fixer climate when we've had kind of the decimation of the financial model undergirding um, many of the major American networks. When I want to do a foreign reporting trip, I usually have to get a grant. You know, so I'm very much, I'm very, I'm very um, budget conscious. Um, but what does that mean for you? Um, and also, um, in the 20 years, roughly, that we've been um, at war in the United States um, ag against terrorism, how have you seen kind of the evolution of Western correspondence um, in terms of like their engagement with fixers, their awareness of the issues? Where do you see the trend lines going? Um, and what advice do you have as we particularly, we may be looking more at um, more reporting in Asia in the years to come? Mm. That was four questions, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll say the, to the first point, the budgets, that's a big issue. Um, it, it means nowadays I turn down a lot of jobs. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, things just can't, can't be done with such little budget. Uh, sometimes I'm amazed at how small the budgets are, um, seeing where it's coming from. Um, they need to allocate their resources more, uh, a lot better, because I've seen that decline. I've seen they, I'm, off, I'm often approached uh, with low ball rates, and you just can't do that. You can't work like that. And I can't imagine what it's like for people elsewhere, you know. So it's tough to, to, to get a story done. Um, I would, um, my comment on the budget, it depends on the organization, on the media outlet. Um, there are like the big names, they have good budget. But also sometimes there are big, big names, they, didn't, they don't have a big budget. So uh, of course you prefer to work with those who are appreciating financially your work. But if you are, and it's difficult because you are in this conflict that you love the job, you want to do it, but they don't have a budget. Like if a student or, um, or a newly grad comes to me and he said, can you help me with this story? I would consider getting my, my, uh, you know, my budget, whatever, the budget down. But if a big organization is trying to play or, or trying to approach me just because I'm a local and giving me like less amount of money, then I wouldn't take it. Mm -hmm. I would help someone with less money who really cannot afford it, but not being underestimated because I'm local, you know? Yeah, I would say uh, correspondence on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a tight budget, they're gonna have to kind of uh, get somebody invested in their sort of vision. If, uh, you know, that's gonna count on a personal connection because I definitely, I mean, Hey, we're in it for the money. Uh, the we at this, I'm probably going to say we for fixers and r correspondents equally. But um, in this case, the we of fixers, we were in it for the money. I mean, I was I, I was in Cairo for 9/11, and every correspondent in the world showed up in Cairo, and you know, not and not necessarily correspondents. Like people got scrambled off the city desk, people got scrambled off of whatever, and sent to Egypt, and we. 
you know, I turned like six of my friends into fixers, basically. Just like anybody with good language skills who could think on their feet. I'm like, you're a fixer now, congratulations. And we actually formed a fixers union of sorts in, in Cairo. Like me and a couple of friends were just like, we're gonna set our rates at X and we're gonna recommend stuff to each other. And this is like, this was pre before American journalism hit the iceberg. You know, this was, this was still that golden age and the money was flowing. And yeah, they, you know, look, if, if, if some human rights NGO wants to come through and do some research, then they could probably pay a little bit less, sure. But, but if you're from a, a, a publication we've heard of, show me the money. Especially if you're risking your life. Yeah. Mm. If you're risking your life uh, and, and you've got this big company at the top and you're here, you know. And you don't have any uh, health insurance, you don't have any security, you don't even have enough training, you know, and awareness. So you're risking so many things. But that's, yeah. I think that's also something uh, that fixers need to do. They need to set their uh, standards higher. And it's okay, you know, sometimes you have to pass on that job, but I think fixers need to set a higher standard, and um, a union is a great idea. I love that, yeah. Yeah. if it was possible. More of a mafia, really, if you get yeah. down to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I, know. I see some questions over here. My name is Abby Olakins Hola. It's more of a statement than a question. So I'm an OIF vet. Um, <clears throat> I was at Victory Base Camp uh, during the surge, so it was 7 08. And uh, we definitely couldn't have done what we did without our fixers, meaning our interpreters and advisors. So just to let you know, I appreciate what you all do. So. No, the, the guys that were doing it for the military, that's a whole other realm of, uh, of risk, absolutely. And I would just put in one mention here. There is the special immigrant visa process, which included people who were interpreters for the military and interpreters for the media, American media. And the idea was that if they found themselves in trouble because of their association with a US organization, whether it was a military unit or a media company, and I believe also contracting, like uh, they could get sort of fast track visas for them and members of their family to the US, I think uh, Ted Kennedy was one of the sponsors of the, that, was that got that through. I, I, I could not believe um, that they opened the doors for, and, for, for our folks, you know. And many did take advantage of it, and you know, by that I mean in a good way, they got themselves to safety in the United States. Uh, some of them are doing great in the US, and, mm. and um, actually a lot of them are. Yeah. Um, and that, over time that's been constrained and shrunk and kind of roadblocks put up to it without exactly doing away with the program. I think lately there's been a new push to try to make that available to people. And it, it applied to Afghanistan also. So, right? Really? Am I right? I think I'm right on that. Um, yeah, and it's really important. And there are still people who, who need that to uh, keep them and their, their families safe. That was a fantastic thing that I'm not sure is, is that widely known in America outside of sort of journalism circles. Is like our, the vast majority of the LA Times Mm -hmm. You know, newsroom, which was probably like twelve people, it would be, mm -hmm. you know, at maximum. You know, the only people that are still in Iraq are the ones that didn't right. want to leave. If you wanted to come, right. they came, and and people have new lives, and right. God bless. Well, it's for to a point. Then they did start to throw up roadblocks, oh, yeah? and just a lot of paperwork became an issue. And but some of the big allies in advocating for were members of the military who knew how critical uh, interpreters were for them. We have a question actually from the live chat. Okay. <clears throat> uh, what are some of the fixers' pet peeves about foreign correspondents? Mm. <laughs> uh, a double barreled question. Do they have some do's and don'ts for reporters? I, I actually think that's probably my, my best case scenario for, for today is we sort of come out of this with a list of best practices for, for correspondents, like what, you know, what, uh, from, from the fixers' perspective. But I mean, just, listen to them, don't, I think there tends to be a bit of a Mad Men, Don Draper, that's what the money's for, um, among, among the, the problematic correspondents where they're just like, hey, I'm paying you, you know, so 
you know, you know, I'm out of milk, go. Yeah, and 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 and, you know, we've had cases like this. I mean, what I mean, we had we had every correspondent in the world come through Cairo after 9/11, and I I I remember there was one journalist who's who's quite prominent actually uh, these days who um, who showed up and bought a. in Egypt, we call it a galabeya, a dishdasha, yani that, that long white robe that uh, Arab men wear, and wanted to wear it on street interviews and had to get, like, basically, it got to the point of, of the news assistant, who was a friend of mine, basically said, I'm not going out with you. About, I'm not leaving this, this apartment with you wearing that. You want to go do your street interviews? Good luck. I'm not doing it. Um, but just. Don't treat them on errands, you know. I, I you know, I, I, you know, I, I had a friend who was deeply offended because a, uh, a correspondent who'd been coming back and forth to Egypt and was then being posted to Egypt, and so it was like, great, you know, they're they're going to work together full time, and he called and asked her to like stock the fridge and and find like riding lessons for his daughter, like horse riding lessons, and the fact that he didn't put it as a favor, like the, the, if he if he'd asked as if, hey, can you do me a favor, between friends, but it just came off as this was like on her list of duties, and maybe she was being hypersensitive, I don't know, but but it bothered her. It bothered her in a way that took a while for their relationship to normalize, because she just felt like she was being used in a way that wasn't in the job description, and it wasn't a, it wasn't an approach. If he'd approached as a friend, saying, help me out. She'd have done it without a heartbeat, but but the fact that it seemed to be just on her list of duties bugged her. Hmm. It's done sometimes with drivers too. Hmm. It's done with drivers. Um, I personally, for me personally, I think the most important is when this visiting journalist leaves, that he would make this local fixer feel the appreciation and send an email. I've received from some of them emails thanking me for my professional work. And to me, that was much more important than the money I made. Because this makes you feel that there's a human connection. We've been together in this tough time. We've done this together. It's very, it's very so beautiful that you send this person a thank you and appreciation. Because some people, they just leave, and they never hear from them until another year when they want a story. And hey, do you remember me? Susan, I'm so and so. Oh, I hardly remember you because you never connect with me. And by the way, NPR, it's not because you're here. Uh, they have a very, very high respect to fixers. I've worked with them sometimes, and I was fascinated by the way they deal with their fixers and the respect they give. So they deal with each other that way every day. I hope. Uh, I'd say most of the journalists, 99% of them, have been wonderful over these years. Um, but I would say, uh, first thing is probably humble yourself. Humble yourself. Um, don't be too pushy. Don't come into a situation and try to impose too much. Um, and also, I think in certain situations, especially a situation like mine, oh, sorry, um, the fixer should have a, a role, a, an integral role in the film, and maybe even the final cutting process. And I say that for this reason. Um, and this is just one instance, but um, I we filmed, um, we interviewed a drug trafficker, uh, someone very uh, high up in a drug trafficking organization. And he was gr- very gracious and led us into his world. We kept him masked up, uh, voice changers, uh, even a bodysuit of sorts to keep him disguised. No location was shown. And I was told that I'd have, uh, you know, I'd be able to look at the final cut and make, uh, you know, say, hey, this is okay or this is okay. The reason they oftentimes, in, in, in my lane, they do this is because I might be able to catch something. Like, hey, you don't want to show this frame because this could jeopardize our subject, which then could jeopardize me and everyone else. Um, and so I caught something. And that was very important before it went out to air. And, but I've also worked on films where that did not happen. And they left, and I never heard from them again. And what came out on the screen was not good. And then I got a phone call. And that phone call was, you messed up. 
it was you that did that. And so then you have to, you know, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> but that's just one instance of, of, so I think it's important that they, they listen to the fixer and, and, and keep them in the loop throughout the whole process from, from pre to shooting to post. Uh, and that, and that across, and the same with news gathering as well, you know. I think the best correspondents form partnerships, you know, and, and it's like, and the, the, and the times when, the only time in my career, I, I gained tremendous respect, uh, the, the only time in my career where I was working uh, with news assistants in an environment where I didn't speak the language, at least partially, like, I mean, when I was in Iraq, it took me two weeks to even understand what anybody was saying in Iraq, because the Iraqi accent is super weird, but, um, but like, I went to cover the, uh, the earthquake in Pakistan, like, 15 years ago in Kashmir and and I had a really hard time sort of I, I gained tremendous respect there's a specific correspondent skill I mean we're you know it's easy to come up here and trash correspondence but 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 like uh, the the there's a real skill to making your vision happen through somebody else like when you don't speak the language and you don't know the background and you're just there and you're you've got your questions but like executing your vision through this partnership with some there's kind of a mind meld that happens and 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 it's hard it's it's a it's a specific skill i mean some sometimes we denigrate sort of the correspondent that parachutes in and you know eight hours on the ground and they're writing with authority about such and such country being able to sort of work with somebody who know they are, they did, and 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 make it happen and and yeah sort of a, forming a joint vision it's it's hard i've i've failed at it in the past uh well i want to thank uh Shirin jafari for that question which uh was provoking very interesting responses hi i'm jody beck i'm a press club member and an independent journalist and sadly i'm looking for a fixer not where any of you work but how do you find a fixer if you're not part of a large news organization I think you usually talk to other correspondents. Uh, sometimes talk to people you've worked with there who you trust. And, you know, often they're in other jobs now, but they've kept track of who's working there. You, you, it's a grapevine. Um, you know, nowadays you can look at Twitter and see if people are, are basically reporting on things through their Twitter feed. Uh, you would still want to know more about them and what their situation is. And then you, you talk to them and listen to what their situation is, what they can do. Um, maybe you do sort of a, a short-term thing so you both get to try each other out and see how the relationship works. I don't know if you all have other ideas on One that. One of the tricks is that, that I saw people use all the time in Egypt is find the local, and this might not be relevant in some countries, but I mean find the local English language publication and you know just, just cold call them and say, who do you got? Um, and you know they're often happy to, to, to take the work, sort of like you know these English, like local journalists working in English and, and, and whatever like that. We used to do that all you know, I, at various uh, English language newspapers and magazines that I worked at in Cairo. We'd always get that sort of just cold call from a from a correspondent saying, "Hey, this is what I'm working on. You got anybody good?" And we're happy to make that recommendation. Actually, it's 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 oh, different. Sorry. It's different. Uh, with me and in uh, in Lebanon, it's it's basically a recommendation by other journalists. Like oh, yeah. there is a story. Uh, I remember, for example, contacting the correspondent by another journalist. How did you do this story? I like it. Okay, who do you have in Lebanon? Contact Susan or contact Lena or contact X. Hmm. So and they contact all of us and we answer back and they select. Sometimes they just want you because they've heard something. So it's more like recommendation and a mouth. I mean, people respect you, so they know if you're also referring other people that they exactly. can trust yeah. that. Yeah. So that's actually, so that's the related question from Daniel Card in San Antonio, Texas, who's watching on the live stream, which is, what are some ways to verify the credibility of fixers? I've usually hired a fixer based on a fellow journalist's recommendation, but what about newer fixers without many reviews? And also, I just want to say, um, I respect the way that Lindsay is um, uh, helpfully uh, giving the spotlight to all the fixers. You also have done a lot of research on this, and so um, if that's come up, you know, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on it too. How about you all go first and <laughs> see? So, the, what was the original question? The, what are some ways to verify the credibility? 
credibility of fixers, Ooh. particularly new fixers. Mm. Uh, well, if, I mean, if they're absolutely new fixers, it's tough to verify their credibility. I'd say ask a lot of questions. Um, know what your objective is and ask a lot of questions. Vet them. Vet them very well. Um, and then, of course, as you were saying, most of the time it's word of mouth. A lot of it is word of so, mouth and leap yeah. of faith. And then, yeah, and, you know, sometimes you have to take a chance. Like if you've never vetted a fixer before, what kind of questions would you ask? Well, you know, that would depend on the subject and, and, and what she's seeking to find or, or cover. Um, so I don't know if I can answer that. I personally, um, I was known, well, because I was known as a journalist before, uh, so they knew that I had credibility. But I, I might be, for example, my son now graduated, so. Um, he's trying to get some fixing work. So, oh, you are the son of Susan? Okay, so maybe your mom is going to push. So it depends. I don't know. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think vetting is, is a real challenge. You know, I mean, you get word of mouth. I mean, if you're someone you know, prominent in the market like Susan, you know, that's, that's a known quantity. And, you know, obviously, like, the people she, re if she can't do it, the people she recommends, you're counting on that. But there's, there's going to be a leap of faith with, all, with, with a lot of this. Even in the case, you know, very recently, probably I think around 2015, there were a couple of different websites that launched that were dedicated just to this question. And one of them is World Fixer, really? um, which I think we have some people from World Fixer maybe watching the, the live stream today. And they have a verification process um, where the, the person um, sort of advertising their skills as fixers and local producers get officially verified through their system and then um, they're marked as verified. They also have testimonials from the journalists they work with. This is clever. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's, you know, I mean, it, it, it might be um, particularly helpful in the cases where someone is newer to the work, um, although I, I have spoken with people who've been doing it for years and have the reputation, um, but also find it somewhat useful to use um, as well just to get new work. So I don't know. I mean, it's still very young. It'll be interesting to see if that, you know, how much more that kind of becomes the norm. Hi, I'm Samuel Breslow. Um, I've heard lots of stories of um, correspondents um, getting information about a culture from their fixers that has influenced the story that they end up reporting. Um, I was wondering if you could share any experiences that you've had where um, a fixer that you've been working with or a correspondent um, you, you've influenced, um, where that has uh, influenced the story, um, or perhaps on the other side, um, where a fixer um, has become too much like a source um, and perhaps introduced some difficulties? I think that's probably an issue that would come up when you're in sort of like sectarian places with a lot of, of sectarian divisions. I would imagine, you know, in, in in Lebanon, if you're if you're you know the person you just happen to be working with is Druze or Maronite, is that going to influence? Or if they're Shiite, are they really going to go after? Are they really going to you know uncover something about Hezbollah that they don't want? Like it's like, and and I would imagine it's just a professional, you know. It, it, it's got to be a risk because everybody brings their own, risk. not only their own sort of prejudices, but just their own network of people, who who are, are, are you know, who they who they know. So so I bet it's a risk in a, in a place like Lebanon more than or, or Iraq. It's very risky in Lebanon because we have a lot of, of sectarian uh, groups. But you try, with your experience, to try to be you try to be neutral. You distance yourself from who, whatever is your background, and it shows with your work gradually. Uh, for example, for me, I try to have good connections with all sects in Lebanon, because um, my daily life is just strict to that. And I'd like to, if there's a story, I like to recommend to the correspondent to talk to all groups, to talk to different parties, to get all the opinions. So this is actually, maybe because I have also a journalistic background, it helps. But yes, it's, it's, it's delicate. It's very delicate. Yeah, so your point, um, oftentimes I've experienced situations where correspondents will come and they will have this synopsis in their head of what, it, what it's like on the ground and what's happening. Uh, 
but you have to keep an open mind. And especially with documentary filming, it's important to have an open mind when following different threads. And uh, you may think that this is where you're going, but you're going you're gonna to veer off that path, um, depending on what you find and what might pop up. So that's pretty common. Uh, I think it's pr probably pretty common everywhere. But um, yeah, you just, you just have to, uh, like you said, distance yourself and try to be, I don't know if objectivity is a, a real thing, <laughs> but yeah, you know, do your best, you know. Try to be ethical about it, you know, and, and moral. I'm trying to think of a, an example of a story that I did or we worked on that was entirely f from the tip of uh, the people we were working with. I can't right now, but it happens a lot. And it's really great. I mean, we've talked about some of the safety issues. Uh, when you're in sync with, with someone and they get what your organization is, which is very difficult. They have no idea what NPR is compared to the AP or the LA Times. We all have different tone and character and different types of stories we're into. But I mean, there are a lot of times where it's, you know, they'll, they'll get it. And, and most of the time they do. It's just a matter of kind of being clear about what your organization does. And it can be, you know, my cousin told me that a house near them got bombed by whatever guys were doing airstrikes. Um, and some of them might be available to talk. Do we want to do that? And, and then you go through kind of the checklist, like, is it dangerous? Do you know, if they're personal friends, that can be difficult because they don't have control over what I'm going to write in the end. But you know, usually it's like great, and you 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 work it out, and then they make the arrangements, and you go talk to them. Um, in a lot of countries all over the world, it's hard to get in someone's house unless you know someone who knows someone who knows someone. Um, there, they you know, people they, they can the more you get to work with them, and you know, they can be reporting with you and making calls, and you go through what you the questions you ask as an editor. You know, so what did this person say? Okay, how did they know that? How do we know they know that? Do they have anything to back it up? Any sort of documents? Or, um, and it can be hugely satisfying. And they see the work at the end, and they feel they feel gratification about it because something that they thought was important to to be said about their country yeah, has been said. Yeah, they're with you. Then that's yeah. a sweet spot. If you and, get, you know, you've and got the relationship to that you know, point, that's great. I'm sure you've worked with people, and you'll be like, "Hey, can you get you know see what the minister of whatever is saying about this?" And they check around, and and you give it to that. They get it, and, and you say, "Oh, this is great." And then they say, "Yes, but the minister is a liar." You know, there's <laughs> all sorts of things that they can gauge that you don't know um, when when you're coming in, even after you've been there for a while. Uh, and it's it can be a really fabulous relationship that that uh, works out for, for, for the, the audience of your organization, for one thing, and then for the two of you personally. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Rula Jodat. I am not a reporter. I'm a mental health professional, so I'm very much appreciating this, uh, this panel because it's really helped me understand how important your work is and um, and also how much risk you take. And so my question to you, and I'm sorry if it's not relevant, uh, is like what makes you tick? I'm really <laughs> interested in knowing what makes you take on all these risks. And so. What makes you take on these risks? What's the, okay. oh, the inspiration? What gets you going? <laughs> oh, we love it. It's very personal. <laughs> <It's great. laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I'm one of those guys. When I, when I was in Cairo, uh, we used to have a, a running joke that sort of half the journalists in Cairo were either converted academics or converted backpackers. That they were either sort of like, you know, Arabic heads who, who they, you know, they, they, they got into this, or they were just traveling around and they loved Cairo and they wanted to figure out a way and, they, you know, they didn't want to teach English, so they sort of got into journalism. I'm I'm one of those guys. I don't know about you, Larry, but I'm I'm one of those guys that never seriously considered doing anything. I was on the high school newspaper and all that stuff, you know, that, just from from day one. Um, so it's just kind of a drive, and then, yeah, I just like telling people stories. And um, and you know, in in Iraq, it felt like a mission. You know, I don't think I would have. For me, it was more, it was more personal in Iraq because, you know, I'm an Arab American. I'm a dual citizen, and 
you know, at the time when America is occupying Arab countries. Like, I felt a need to tell these people's stories. And, um, but if you took those same levels of risk and put it in the Philippines, I don't know that I would have taken that risk to tell those stories. So I'm, I'm a little different on that. But I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're more traditional correspondent. I think they're, they're driven by, I mean, look, nobody's in this for the money. You know, I mean, the TV people get paid, but I mean, but, but, but the rest of us, I think we're just, we're just dri into it. You know, it's, you, we're storytellers. You know, my first editor in Fort Wayne, Indiana, you know, planted that idea in my head. You are a storyteller. You are, you are the inheritor of a tradition that goes back to the town criers and the scribes. You know, you know, it, it's, it's, it's important. That's, that's. And these stories, they become history. And, they're, and if you don't tell the story, it's gone. But if you keep telling the stories, they're accumulating and they're becoming history. And I think this is a great job. So we tend to be a cynical bunch, but at the end of the day, <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, I mean, if you get past the eye rolling and people feel weird talking, I think a lot of us do feel a sense of mission. We just feel weird articulating it sometimes. I love that word you said, mission, because oftentimes I feel like I'm on a mission. A secret mission. It, it is secret. It is a secret mission. Um, but that's a very personal question. I would love to talk to you after this. I mean, <laughs> mental health is uh, is important, and and what drives someone like myself or or anyone out on this panel or anyone out there to do this type of work? I don't know. I can't. I would like to know. I would genuinely <laughs> like to know. Um, but I ask myself that all the time. It probably has something to do. Uh, with the path I took in life and maybe some other factors, but I don't know. Uh, I know I, I feel good, I feel alive, and that's, and I'm, I'm, I'm a very passionate person uh, when it comes to telling stories, and I'm genuinely interested in learning about my subjects and what's happening, so, yeah. Could you just reference the path you took? <clears throat> so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Do you want to say anything about the project you're currently working on? Uh, well, sure. Uh, I mean, I can't really say too much about it, but um, I'm, um, I can give you the basics. Uh, I'm working on a documentary uh, right now. It's an independent documentary uh, about a murder uh, that I witnessed uh, when I was young and uh, as a juvenile. And the juvenile that committed that act uh, was sentenced to life in prison, where he remains to this day. And uh, from my POV uh, perspective, I'm delving back into this uh, case and this situation. Yeah, it was 22 years ago now. So, yeah. But I, I would love to tell you more. But I'm just in the in the midst of of you know getting in there. So. I I can't. We will all stay tuned. You can let us know <laughs> sure. when there's more that you can reveal. Definitely. Meanwhile, we have another question. When I arrived in Baghdad, I had a similar question about many of my colleagues that I had around me because that was, you know, like I said, I showed up just like as an Arab American wanting to tell the story of this particular conflict. Um, but I found myself surrounded by much more veteran uh, correspondents who had been through multiple, like people who knew each other from Kosovo, and some of the old heads knew each other from El Salvador. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what made them tick, mm -hmm. you know? And some of, them, and some, of them, some of them are amazing people, and some of them really don't know what to do with themselves if they're not in a war zone. I'm gonna unplug your new book for a minute and just say it's a very well-reported book about fixers, and I think you might find some answers in it also about maybe why people do what some of take on some of the risk of that work. Is that fair, Lindsay? I think so. I, I think that's <laughs> fair, and I, I think that um, there are a lot of different reasons why, especially more on on the side of fixing, that people sort of choose to do um, what they do. But a lot of a lot of people have said similar things to what you all are saying, which is this love for the story. Um, uh, the word mission comes up a lot because, especially for people who are, are wanting to share and sort of help make sure that stories that are happening in their own home regions um, are shared with the world. There, that's, that's a way to sort of help make it happen. Um, but I think it's really interesting you know, to hear all of you talking about 
the the sense of passion that you each have. And I wonder, you know, I mean, one of the the things that you kind of asked was, what, why do you all take risks um, in order to to be able to tell these stories? And so I have like a slightly more cynical question for all of you that I've been kind of mulling over here. And I, I hate to take it back cynical after mm. going into um, some of the really deep reasons why we do these things. But what are your thoughts on news organizations' role in helping to protect fixers? Kind of taking things back more a little bit more pragmatic. I mean, I think sometimes the, that passion, both for foreign correspondents and for fixers and for people who've done all of those things, can can um, I don't want to say like be exploited, but it, it it is something that that helps to make news production happen. So, what's the role then of news organizations, uh, according to your opinions, in protecting fixers? If I can take this first, um, I have um, I have witnessed at least I work with the Washington Post now. I've witnessed that my uh, my career had got me my fixing career had got me to get the job. So, and this is why I would like to help those who are new in this job. I would like to give them my experience. And um, I think news organizations can, can get in and, and give some credit, more credit to, to those fixers. Like, they should be aware of the role of these fixers. What do you think, Ashraf? So Absolutely, I, credit is important. And, and yeah, I mean, one advice I was given with the correspondent, hey man, be generous with the double bylines. That means a lot. To, to, to people, it's not, you know, that, that, that means a lot. Um, and protection, because there's many levels of protection. We're not just sort of like, you know, the things that, that the, the, you know, the things you need to sort of protect in Iraq or different than in, in, in Egypt, and I think this happens in a lot of places, uh, the government, when they didn't like the way things were going and the way they didn't like the coverage, they'd crack down on the fixers, because they're citizens. Right. And there's not a, I mean, I'm not sure what the news organization can really do. I mean, you can write a strongly worded letter to the interior ministry or the, 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 you know, the information ministry, but at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's how the Egyptians would get to the correspondence was through the fixers. Mm. And, and you, you would hear them. They'd, they'd, they'd call them in and yell at them and, and say, like, all you do is take people to the Muslim Brotherhood and take people to, to you know, just ruining, you're getting paid to ruin Egypt's reputation. And... That's a tough one. I mean, because they live there. I mean, this this is their government. There's, I'm, I'm not sure what the Post or NPR or whoever can really do if the local government decides that that your person is helping ruin the reputation of such and such country. And I bet that that happens all the time everywhere. You have the conversation. Yeah, you'd actually tell. Yeah, you you you, you have to have the conversation. I mean, it's and. I mean, we've we've did, tried to come up with all these different names. I mean, we're we're colleagues, and that's the the way it works. Whether it's fixer or it's a producer, we I mean, we have power dynamics within an organization in between correspondents and reporters and news assistants, and and uh, so you have to have the conversation 360 degrees. Like, what's this going to mean for you? What's this going to mean for us? Uh, you d you can't shade stories. To you know, you, you can't the off of your right. Yeah. You you can't you can't do that. No. So how can we get at this story a different way? Um, you know, are there ways? You, you know, sometimes it's not a good idea to give the person credit on the piece, right? Especially if they're really not shaping the piece, um, because then they get in trouble for something. Uh, it is a good idea to give them a read back on on items you're not sure about. To see whether it will get them in trouble. Um, sometimes if there's a change you can make in a story that doesn't change the nature of the story, but just doesn't identify a certain person in a way that would, would keep that one of your people your situation. Off the firing line, yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, whatever shot could have gotten you in trouble, if they had edited that out, it wouldn't have changed the nature of the thing. It just would have probably been a more narrow close up or something that didn't show whatever could have identified something. Um, so you, you have to have the talk both ways and, and Constantly, all along the process, um, and then there there are other things. I mean, there, you know, are are they being insured? Do you have equipment for them? Uh, you know, body armor or whatever. Mm. Um, you know, like I always say, also we don't say, "Oh, this is really dangerous. Better put your body armor on." It's you never plan to go. You shouldn't be planning to go into a place where I think there's going to be shooting going on. It's more like 
we're going to this place, we don't think there's going to be shooting, but have the body armor in the car in case something happens that we're, that's totally unexpected. Um, you know, do you have enough for everyone in your group, the driver uh, as well? Um, and, and again, just have, have the talk and listen to, to what they're concerned about. We have time for one or two more questions. Can I just add one other thing? A, a good rule is don't ask the local person to do anything you wouldn't ask the correspondent to do. Unless yeah. the local person says, I can go into this building and no one will notice me and that's fine. I don't want to bring you in because you're mm -hmm. obviously a foreigner and that's going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, have that talk too. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, my name is Daphne Pellegrino and I'm with Reporters Without Borders. Thank you so much for being here today and it's been fascinating hearing your perspectives uh, and everything that you've shared, um, especially hearing about the work that NPR is doing to prepare both correspondents and fixers for the work that's going to be done overseas um, and the sort of safety assessments that take place ahead of time. I'm curious to know if there are similar, if there's similar work being done for independent safety training programs, um, maybe not uh, within news organizations to prepare correspondents for uh, the work that they're doing with fixers and to ensure the safety of fixers. I don't know if this is something that you came across in your research. There, there are some um, very young programs like that that are just starting to be um, marketed more specifically toward fixers. I mean, there have been there's been safety training for a long time. I mean, since you know at least the the wars in the Balkans, but I think maybe possibly even before that. But um, there there have been some you know smaller scale programs, and sometimes these happen more locally um, in the, a particular city or region, where people who are local journalists or who do the work of of um, fixing can go and get certain types of training that may be useful, though, again, the you know, it's very contingent. You, you don't know what type of danger all the time um, you need to be preparing for. So that's, a, as I think some of you, you know, mentioned, that's part of the problem also. But I'm interested to hear what, what you all have, have heard of this. I think there's some independent, there's, there's, there's NGOs and foundations. I mean, when I ended up in Iraq, I went to Iraq as a freelancer and then gradually, and then ended up sort of like hooking up with the LA Times after a couple of months there. But as a result of that unorthodox way, I was like the one person in the room who had had no security training of any kind, no first aid, no any, the, the, the centurion training that everybody went to before they went to Iraq, I just didn't have it. And so I was able to get it, and I think some of the local news assistants also were able to get it through, I can't remember I, there was a particular foundation. Yeah, there's a foundation. There's at least one that was that was that just was turning, sort of yeah. like doing like security training for independent operators in, in in these zones, and ideally that would be also be open for news assistants, not just sort of freelance writers. Or I'm gonna um, hand the microphone to our friends at IWMF to talk a little bit about this. Yeah, so the um, I'm Charlotte Fox. Um, I'm with the International Women's Media Foundation. I'm here with my colleague Madison. Um, and news assistants and fixers have been such a huge part of our network and the work that we do with women journalists around the world. And part of that are the hostile environment and first aid trainings that we offer. Um, and those can be kind of isolated or those can be tied to reporting trips um, for local journalists, freelancers, um, and those who are involved with the reporting life cycle. Um, but I think to Lindsay's point, it's so important that these are location specific. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why our trainings, who are, you know, these are open to anyone who, who would want to apply to them, um, have different types of situational analysis. So if you are in an area that's concentrated on reporting where you might endure civil unrest, that could be very different if you're in an area where you might be a target um, or potentially go through uh, a kidnapping scenario. Um, I actually had another question. I don't know if it's appropriate or if, or if anyone else wanted to make a comment on that. I've never heard of, I mean, I, I'm aware of hostile environment training. I think it's important for fixers in, in this current state to invest in yourself, invest in yourself, uh, and invest in yourself in a way that adapts to you and who you are, um, you know, medical and, yeah, so. Absolutely, and I think, um, you know. I'm interested to learn more about 
your organization. Yeah. Sure, yeah, IWMF.org. <laughs> if anyone was interested, we were founded 30 years ago here in Washington um, by prominent newswomen in the industry who wanted to be able to extend the same type of um, resources, skills, and training that they were experiencing to um, journalists and freelancers abroad. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting about our training is obviously we're uh, a women journalist organization. Um, and so I'd be super interested to hear um, from you all if there is, like what the gender makeup is um, with news assistants or um, with fixers abroad and how those gender dynamics um, and that makeup might have changed over the past few decades. And if there are still barriers that create a disparity, um, how you might break those barriers down. I mean, Susan, we saw you with Liz Sly at our Courage and Journalism Awards this fall, and so I'd be super interested to hear your perspective on that as well. Well, actually, uh, uh, about the training thing, I've been through the training, and thanks to the Washington Post and to Liz who arranged this. Um, yeah, the, the tendency of having more females in the field is getting, the number is increasing. And I think for, at least from my experience, when, when I'm working in Lebanon, uh, there were more female fixers able to get to Syrian refugee camps and talk to the Syrian woman, because the Syrian woman wouldn't talk to a man in these camps. So this was increasing the number of women fixers anyway. I mean, that's one of the points I can remember. But yeah, there has been an increase in that. And it makes it easier for the for the woman to convince than the man because men are a bit more mm -hmm. serious and hard. No, no, yeah, it becomes something you can. It becomes something you can use. I mean, it, it, it's it's useful. It's and, and I knew, gosh, I feel like there was a, a quite a high percentage of female news assistants in Cairo. Um, Baghdad, much less so, which is much I think more about Iraqi society than anything else. Well, in Lebanon. I think 90% of the news assistants and uh, fixers are women. Really? Yeah. That's Very cool. few. I mean, my son may be one of the 10%. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much to our uh, panelists and our audience. Thank you, Lindsay, for bringing your book to us today. And and copies of the book are still available outside. I'll plug your book, too. Um, one more thing before we leave. Um, I want to talk about someone who's not here in the room with us today. Uh, you may have noticed uh, that some of us here are wearing um, pins. Julie has one here that say, Free Austin Tice. Um, Austin is the only American journalist who has been held abroad in captivity. And he's been detained for 2,726 days in, t in Syria. He was taken while he's reporting um, on the conflict there from McClatchy in the Washington Post. And the US government believes that Austin is alive and they are working to bring him home. Austin's family has been fighting for his freedom for more than seven years and we here at the National Press Club and National Press Club Journalism Institute stand with them. The National Press Club just announced that the second annual Night Out for Austin will be on April 29th. And the Night Out for Austin is where restaurants here in the DC area and across the country will commit a portion of their proceeds from that evening sales to supplement the FBI reward fund leading to information that can help with Austin's safe return. We hope you'll join us on that evening and with our uh, campaign to um, free Austin Tice. You can learn more about the that evening at nightoutforaustin.com. Thank you for supporting that, and thank you for being here with us this afternoon, and for those of you on our live stream as well. Mm -hmm.